uh, parliamentary monarchy. So this is this is um, the final section of the historical survey that I'm going to do in this in this series of videos. Uh, you know, I said, uh, you know, this is a long durée sort of approach to history. There's a lot of details here, but I'm, I'm trying to draw those connections and see how things evolve over decades and centuries. And um, in this last section is where we see all the different threads uh, that I've sort of established so far all come together and coalesce. Um, and this is the big story in, in many presentations. Oh, uh, when um, when people speak of the English Revolution, they speak of this time period, and they just see this event, which is a very short event, as the English Revolution, and it just happened quick, you know. But you know, as I've suggested, I think a longer perspective, seeing how all these different uh, machinations sort of go back and forth, it starts to make a lot more sense. It's not like, oh, somebody had, you know, got lucky or uh, had a great strategy and then they won the day and then it was all over very quickly. It's like, this is the culmination of decades and decades and decades of, of unrest, all going all the way back to the Wars of the Roses. Okay, so from the end of the Wars of the Roses, that was like a big civil war then you had a declining feudal order, uh, a real crisis of the monarchy with James and Charles in the beginning of, of the 17th century, and then the English Civil War in the middle of the 17th century, the Commonwealth return, the restoration of the monarchy, which ultimately comes absolute monarchy, both in the case of Charles II and in the case of James II. And, and then we have the final act. Um, finally, things are settled, are resolved. So we left off with James in his declaration of indulgence. Good for a lot of non-Anglicans but alienates uh, the Tories, highly destabilizing for the government of uh, James II. And meanwhile, we have Louis uh, on the continent. Louis XIV is still out there, uh, the big dog on the continent, big Catholic monarch, ruling as an absolute monarch, no question about it. Um, just arbitrary power. He has the military behind him. He is the, the chief executive. Uh, he is the commander in chief. You know, there's just no question about his absolute authority. And he's expanding. He's, he's pushing the boundaries of the French Empire. He's engaging in wars, um, uh, naval engagements in Italy. He's all over the place, um, just causing trouble. And this is a staunchly Catholic uh, monarch and really trying to reverse the Protestant Reformation. Uh, so alliances begin to form to contain Louis, especially alliances among Protestant uh, nations. Um, we have the Union of Waterau. So this is an alliance of states within the Holy Roman Empire, but William of Orange is involved. Now his states are not part of the Holy Roman Empire, but they're coordinating. And, and he's really, he's really uh, setting up the whole arrangement. And part of this union includes a union army, an army that belongs to the several states that are allied together, but it operates as a single unified army. And many of the high officers in this army are Dutch, are William's guys. Um, there's the Luxembourg uh, Alliance, which also forms its own Union Army. So they're starting to think of coordinating on a larger scale in order to fight off 
the well-organized super army of Louis XIV. Uh, we have the League of Augsburg, um, which combines the uh, Luxembourg alliance with uh, more states. They, they fold in more states. And so this is building to a war of these Protestant states that now have a pretty, they have pretty large alliances and these alliances are all networked together and the common enemy is Louis. Uh, and in the midst of this, Louis issues his Edict of Fontainebleau and um, he abolishes religious freedom for the Huguenots, the, the Protestants within France, uh, which had their own distinct sort of theology and, and practices, um, but largely along Calvinist lines, um, kind of like the Puritans, but, uh, uh, but not stylistically, but theologically. Um, and so Protestant states are, are, are alarmed. Um, now, back in England, we have the seven bishops controversy in May to June, uh, of 1685. Um, James had issued the Declaration of Indulgences that I said was highly destabilizing. Um, many Anglican ministers didn't read it at the time that it was originally issued uh, and didn't follow it. And James orders here in, um, in 1688, uh, uh, that uh, so we're really talking about I want to make sure I got this written correctly. Uh, yeah, well, so this is in sixteen eighty eight. so we're we're building up to sixteen eighty. so this should say May, June of sixteen eighty eight. Um, so James uh, orders like a year later that, you know, he, he specifically orders the clergy and the Anglican church to read this in, in Sunday service and make sure everybody hears it. Um, and uh, it's supposed to be, uh, so he, he uh, makes that very specific in May and then in mid-May, these seven bishops write a letter, an open letter to James asking that they be excused from this requirement. So they respectively ask to be excused. Um, they're called before James in, on June 8th. And two days later, Prince James is born. Okay, so you have these these belligerent, or not belligerent, but these, these uh, <laughs> uh, resistant clergy, high level bishops resisting the command of the king. And then the king's son is born, Prince James, uh, which now displaces Mary as the heir apparent. Because up until this point, James did not have a child. And that made Mary, who was his daughter, the, uh, the, uh, the heir apparent, or let's say James did not have a male child up to this point. And that makes uh, Mary the heir apparent to the throne of England. And Mary is married to William of Orange. So Mary was next in line up until the 10th of June here. Mary is married to William of Orange, obviously a staunch Protestant. She's married to the Protestant hero. Uh, and so there's some hope that she could take the throne and then you know, restore England to uh, you know, uh, Anglican sort of conformity thing or something like that. So the Tories are even hanging on to that as a hope. 
uh, and create some level of toleration for whatever James is doing. But now James has a baby that's going to be raised Catholic and is the heir apparent to the throne. Okay. Following this, uh, later in the month, we have the trial of the seven bishops. The, the bishops refuse to post bail. When they're asked to post bail, they're in prison. They're put in the Tower of London. They have a trial on June 29th, and then they are acquitted on June 30th. So uh, uh, the judges in the trial find no reason for uh, them not to be excused in this. So the judiciary is now pushing back against James and the public enthusiasm really for this causes anti-Catholic riots where uh, Catholic properties are, are attacked and Catholics are attacked on the street and there's just uh, rioting in, in this fashion. And this is widespread throughout the whole country as the news of this trial spreads and as the news of the birth of Prince James spreads. So these two events uh, coalesce to, to uh, cause a big anti-Catholic um, uprising. Meanwhile, war breaks out on the continent. So there, those alliances had been forming for years, uh, alliances against Louis, and Louis invades the Holy Roman Empire. So now these alliances are already in place. Louis invades the Holy Roman Empire against um, uh, against Protestants. The, the, all these alliances are activated. And now there's a very large continental war shaping up. The Dutch Navy, uh, there's two great navies at this point. There's the Dutch Navy and there's the English Navy. The Dutch Navy is securely in the camp of the Protestants against Louis because William of Orange. The English Navy is up in the air. Is James gonna side with Louis? his Catholic compatriot who, you know, uh, uh, Charles, his uh, uh, Charles had already been in secret treaty with, uh, with Louis and uh, this was public knowledge now. Um, or is James going to side with his son-in-law, William of Orange, Protestant? So it's very questionable. Uh, and the English Navy might be decisive in this war. So William of Orange uh, begins to organize an invasion fleet of England. And so he starts putting together a fleet of ships to invade England in September. Um, this you know, is hard to conceal. Um, and James becomes aware of it, starts getting very nervous. Um, and then William on November 3rd in the Glorious Crossing uh, crosses the English Channel into England, uh, lands at Torbay in the lower, lower uh, west end of, of England and begins a slow march towards London, sort of biding his time and creating a, it's sort of a campaign by fear because William of Orange, of course, is considered on a par with Louis and nobody's, you know, standing up to Louis unless they have to and nobody's standing up to William unless they have to. Uh, and in the Glorious Crossing, it was a big propagandistic sort of thing where there's lots of fanfare and flying of large flags and shooting of cannons and military parades. So this is not like a, a strictly uh, military exercise. There's a lot of propaganda involved in all this. And 
uh, William just starts to march towards London and James flees in December of 1688. Uh, he's captured the next day and then returned to London uh, by the 16th. And, um, but William sends word, he's like, hey, I will give you safe passage out of London. I'll give you an escort out of, out of London. Uh, maybe it's just time for you to leave, uh, dad. You know, this is his, <laughs> this is his father. Um, and of course, William doesn't want to, uh, you know, he, he is related to this guy. His, his wife is, is James's daughter. Um, you know, he doesn't want to uh, destroy uh, physically uh, James. So James leaves England permanently on December 23rd. And, and, the, and the, the glorious revolution, uh, sometimes just referred to as the English revolution is over within, you know, a couple of months. Um, but it's largely just a display of force. There's very little actual fighting that takes place during this. Um, a convention parliament is called. This is like calling up a parliament to decide a new form of government again, uh, just as we had seen previously. Um, first order bill of business is a bill of rights, um, which is drafted in February and then is, is, uh, is affirmed by the crown in, in December. There's a toleration act in May. So here we have um, a sort of revision of the Declaration of Indulgences. And so it gives freedom of worship to nonconformists. That means like Puritans and other separatists uh, can worship in any way they want, uh, but there is an oath of allegiance and supremacy required. Um, and an oath rejecting transubstantiation. So this gives broad toleration for most Protestants, including Puritans and other factions of Protestantism, but it's no good for Catholics because of the oath against transubstantiation and the oath of supremacy, which has uh, uh, the Church of England is separate from Rome. That might be okay, but the transubstantiation, transubstantiation um, a, a genuine Catholic to take that oath uh, would have to be lying. And, um, uh, and then Quakers are now excluded again because they don't take oaths of any kind. Okay. Um, and so this toleration act is not so tolerant, okay but it's specifically targeted at Catholics because they're trying to remove any attempt by uh, people in the line of succession to the throne from returning to Catholicism. They're trying to just eliminate Catholicism as a legitimate uh, form of religion. Uh, the parliament agrees to crown William and Mary um, jointly so they wanted to crown just Mary and have William be her consort, but not have actual executive power of the, of the monarchy. And William strong armed them into making him joint ruler uh, with Mary so that, um, so that even in the event of her death, he could continue to rule England as the executive. Um, so he pushes that through, you know, they didn't have much bargaining power at, at this point. And then the coronation occurs on April the 11th. Um, and uh, not long after there's the Jacobite rising in Scotland. So remember that Charles II had been King of England until Cromwell went and, and expelled him from Scotland. There is always an affinity for, um, for uh, 
a, a monarchy that would that would uh, acquiesce to Presbyterian church government uh, in Scotland. So there's still a strong royalist um, faction uh, widespread throughout Scotland, not only amongst the populace, but also amongst the nobles and members of the Scottish parliament. Uh, and the Jacobite rising is uh, Jacobite is uh, Jacob is or let's say James is a is a Latinized or, or really Greek Greco Roman version of Jacob. And Jacob's a name from the Old Testament of the Bible, and James is a, a name from the New Testament of the Bible. But James is just a a, a Greco-Roman version of, of Jacob. Um, that's where James the second here, that's where his name comes from. And so the Jacobite rising is a Jamesian, uh, you know, rising. Uh, and these skirmishes go on for quite a while up in Scotland and is not put down until 1692, ultimately. Um, so that then, you know that those are the, were the last holdouts to returning James to the throne because James just went into exile. He had always come back, you know, in this um, back and forth that we've already seen with the restoration. Uh, now um, we have the Grand Alliance. Uh, that ultimately forms uh, against France. So here's the, those, those smaller alliances now start to coalesce into a larger alliance um, under the leadership of William, who is now the King of England. So now William controls the Dutch Navy and the English Navy. They have absolute sea power. Um, which is very decisive. Um, so William forms the Grand Alliance where we have England and the Dutch Republic, that's, that's William. And then the Holy Roman Empire uh, is brought in uh, fully in alliance with, with this generally Protestant uh, alliance against Catholic Louis, but in the Holy Roman Empire, there's still there's still duchies and provinces that are that are Catholic, but they're all allied now against France, and uh, this begins the Nine Years' War, and um, uh, which uh, constrains. Louis quite a bit. Um, then we have the second parliament of William and Mary uh, and Queen Mary dies. So good thing that William strong armed parliament into giving him uh, joint uh, royalty with her. William and Mary end up having no children. So there's no there's no succession of their children. Um, so there's a Prince William who is the son of Anne and Anne is the younger sister of Mary who just died. So since Anne has a son, her son is the, is the next in line. Prince William um, is uh, is very young. I don't know how old he is at this point. Um, the Triennial Act is in, instituted. Now this becomes very significant for, for the governance of England in the following decades. So every three years, a new parliament has to be called. So every three years, there has to be a new election of parliament. Um, so that parliament has to be dissolved and the new elections held every three years. And there was also requirements, I can't remember the details, that it has to be seated so many times per year um, or every two years or something like that. 
Um, so it creates a much more democratic uh, political uh, activity with parliament and parliament now does have a lot of control over the monarchy as well. Um, and uh, the Triennial Act does cause some trouble because it's like too frequent and there's too many elections and too much politicking, but uh, this is a, a, a big turn in the direction of democracy. The third parliament uh, now of William as sole uh, monarch um, is being conducted uh, 1695 to 1698. The peace of Ryswick concludes the Nine Years' War, so the Nine Years' War is resolved. Um, but William wants to maintain a large standing army. So they've, they've, they've built up the Navy, they built up the uh, ground troops, they have a very large army. Uh, William you know, has a, a vast military resources in Holland and in England. And he wants to maintain a, a high military uh, standing army, uh, a large standing uh, army. Parliament forces him to reduce the troop numbers to 10,000, okay? Which seems like a drop in the bucket uh, the way we talk nowadays, but at the time it was a very large army nonetheless. Uh, there's a Quakers Act that comes out allowing affirmation instead of an oath. So, so even to this day uh, in English courts and, and in the United States, this happens too. Um, like if you're called in and you're just, you're just told to put your hand on the Bible and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, uh, Quakers objected to swearing, just like you don't swear on, don't swear on anything. Don't swear on the Bible, don't swear on anything. Um, uh, so, so Quakers are allowed in some circumstances under this act to affirm. So they say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? And they, and they can say, I do affirm. I'm saying yes. I'm not swearing, I'm just saying yes. Um, uh, we have the fourth parliament the army is reduced again now down to 7,000 and Prince William dies at age 11. Okay, so that young Prince William who after Mary died became the heir apparent now has died at age 11. Um, and so the succession is a little up in the air but Anne now is the heir apparent, uh, William, Prince William's mother who is the sister of Mary, okay. Um, and the fifth parliament of William, uh, James dies, this is James the second. So he's in exile. So James, is, so the Jacobite, uh, you know, returned to the throne, which still could be a thing if, if William were to die here and Anne is the heir apparent, there might be some attempt to bring back James as more a more authentic, legitimate heir, or, or you know, a title to the throne, uh, because um, him being a male, you know, and with William out of the picture, that was still a, a possibility. But now James is dead. Okay, so that's cleared up. So that thing makes things a lot more settled. Uh, but in the Fifth Parliament, they pass the Act of Settlement. And this ex excludes all descendants of Charles the first other than Anne. So, um, so they make a special exception for Anne. And, and then uh, according to the regular line of heredity, the throne would pass to Sophia of Hanover, Hanover or her descendants um, on the death of Anne. So they're just making a special exception for Anne saying, okay, we're gonna put her on the throne. And then after that, it goes to the line of Sophia of Hanover. Um, and that passes through. Um, 
And, but also part of this, because now they're, they're in Sophia of Hanover, now this is over in, in the Holy Roman Empire. Now they're proposing handing over the throne to maybe some German, you know, uh, William was one thing, uh, at least there's a strong connection, you know, proximity between the Netherlands and England. But now they're talking about handing over the throne in the event of Anne's death to some German that doesn't even remotely speak English. And, and ultimately is what happens. Um, but it, uh, foreseeing that eventuality, they could curtail the monarchy's power quite significantly. And this is really where we get a parliamentary monarchy so that the monarch becomes much more of a figurehead and most of the uh, serious decisions are being made by the parliament and ultimately out of this evolves uh, the prime minister who's elected by parliament as a member of parliament, uh, but then has an executive role and the, and the monarch becomes super, you know, just nearly a figurehead. And that's what we have today in England. Uh, you know, the queen of England uh, is, not, uh, is not running the government. You know, she's just there for ceremonial purposes, blah, 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 blah. Um, this is the beginning of that. Now it takes a century, you know, for more than a century. Because even in the time of the it takes more than a century for um, the strength of the prime minister to really develop. Uh, because even in the time of the American Revolution of the colonies against, against England, King George is still, um, you know, uh, a powerful executive. Um, but the curtailment of that power begins right here with the Settlement Act of 1701. And this is, this is really the end of the story. And then there's just a little epilogue here. Um, is the Sixth Parliament, uh, there's a security of the sex section, the act just to sort of reinforce the, the Succession Act, um, or sort of reinforce the Settlement Act that uh, public officials have to denounce James Francis Edward Stewart, who was James II, who just died. That was his son. And for a time, uh, this James Stewart um, did claim to be the rightful heir of the throne. Uh, I think pretty much throughout his entire life, but it never amounted to a serious threat. Cons uh, uh, parliamentary monarchy had now been instituted. Uh, you know, the act of settlement really, really solidified things. Um, the Quaker Act allowing affirmation is extended. It only had a temporary time period. Um, William dies in 1702 and Anne succeeds him to the throne and we have parliamentary uh, monarchy. A monarch who has some executive power but is highly constrained by parliament and parliament now is gaining power progressively over the monarchy in a, in a systematic fashion throughout the rest of the history of England. Okay, so that, that's the end of the historical story. And this is what, we're, what I was trying to get to. So um, uh, that's all the details of this convoluted story, uh, but shows you the way in which class warfare is a consistent feature of history. That the monarchy and the heir apparents, uh, you know, potential heirs, to the throne acting as a against the nobility, the high nobility, 
uh, and there's you know conflicting relationships there. Um, you have ability acting against commoners. You have the Tories in the House of Lords acting against the Whigs uh, from the City of London, and they're all competing for power, and they're trying to establish their power uh, uh, in relationship to one another. And at times, you have revolutionary consciousness that emerges, where, for example, you have the, the long parliament that says, we're going to form an army on our own, apart from you, Charles I, and we're going to run the military, and you're not. Uh, but of course, then Charles forms his own army, OK, and then that causes trouble. But, but that's really the uh, a moment of consciousness for parliament in the long parliament that, that really is a turning point. And then we just have the sort of after effects of that uh, till ultimately we have the Act of Settlement in 1701, which is really a very self-conscious act on the part of parliament to establish the, the power of parliament, now a combined House of Lords and Commons, uh, against the monarchy. Um, I guess very similar to the consciousness of the Long Parliament at the beginning. But the Long Parliament has that moment of consciousness, uh, but then is that is sort of torn apart by the military coups of the New Model Army. So they, the Long Parliament formed the New Model Army, and the New Model Army was ultimately its undoing this the parliament under William and Mary uses that experience to constrain the military to reduce the standing military and therefore reduce the power and prestige of the high ranking officers and protected it itself against military coup and then you know really solidifies things with the act of settlement highly constraining the executive power of the monarch <clears throat> All right, that, that takes a lot of very clear class consciousness uh, to make that change. That's what revolution is about. All right, so, so we want to be thinking about that from a Marxist perspective, uh, first of all, and then, and then uh, thinking about it in the terms that Dussel wants to talk about this. All right, so that's what I have for you for that. And then there's one more section uh, where I want to talk about uh, the outcome of the class structure uh, after the glorious revolution.